Welcome back to What Would It Cost? On today's episode, we're with Serena Holmes, and we're going to be talking about leveraging your property for future investments. Welcome, Serena. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming out. Uh, first off, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, for sure. So I am a licensed realtor and I'm also a very active real estate investor. But prior to transitioning, I ran my own brand experience agency for 18 years called Tigris. And we specialized in event staffing and event planning. Very nice. Awesome. So what made you shift into real estate and real estate investing? Yeah, for sure. So I was winging it really for the first eight (laughs) years that I was in business. And then I realized, you know, I probably have a lot to learn and started interviewing business coaches and landed on Uh, one woman in particular. And when she was starting to look at my numbers, she said, you know, you have a lot of money in your business. Like, you know, most businesses operate on just three months and you're operating on like a year and a half. And at the time I just thought, you know, no matter what, I can cover things like if big projects Mm -hmm. come in, I can cover our bills and then some. But really she got me to look at it from the perspective that I could invest with some of those retained earnings and start to think of, you know, setting myself up better from like a financial future standpoint. So my comfort level was six months. Uh, So I took out the difference and then I combined that with some money in my home equity line of credit along with um, some money in my TFSA and I bought a short-term rental in Florida. So that was my first real estate investing foray outside of my primary residence. That's amazing. I love that you're the first one you went south of the border right off the bat. (laughs) Well, it made the dollar was par, right? So I knew that no matter what, the dollar is not going to stay par forever. So that was a big part of the profitability when I sold. And then the market did increase a bit as well. That's awesome. Yeah. And I want to talk first a bit about that home equity line of credit Mm -hmm. because it's it's something that some people love, some people hate. You know, everybody has a a different opinion on it. But I want to take your opinion on, you know, the advantages of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I first got it, um, I hadn't really thought about it when I bought the house. But the house that we bought was very well maintained, but very dated. So we renovated, you know, five level back split over four to six months when he first bought it. And then it obviously increased the value. So when we had it reappraised, it came in about 150,000 higher than we bought it for. So that opened up the home equity line of credit. Right. So that obviously helped for that purchase. And then years later in 2017, when the market really started to ramp up, we had it appraised again and it appraised more than 600,000 over what we bought it for. So as you can imagine, like my HELOC really went up. Exactly. Um, And at the time, I didn't really know what to do with it, but I joined a real estate education uh, company and the consultant I was working with was like, you know what, if you have no mortgage and you've got this huge HELOC, like you could be making like all this money from it. And I really hadn't thought about the concept of leveraging debt to make Mm -hmm. money in in that way, really. But they introduced me to that concept and, you know, it's kind of started to get my feet wet in that area as well. Yeah, it's awesome because it's so versatile, the HELOC. You have that. Mm-hmm. Usually it's typically like a prime plus one, but you're able to either fix in a portion of it, keep the other part revolving. As you're paying back, it goes back into the revolving. Exactly. But like we were talking about earlier off screen, you know, as long as you're making that spread, mm-hmm. you're, you're always staying winning. You know, yeah. you're, yes, your HELOC right now, you know, current rates might be nearing 8%, yeah. but you have that private lending as an example or these land assemblies that you're mm-hmm. nearing 15 to 20% of yeah. interest that you're making. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I hadn't thought about it a whole lot until I was introduced to this company and all the concepts. So initially when that kind of started, I, I went into their first investor summit thinking, okay, I've got some money in my business that I can use. Mm-hmm. So I bought two pre-construction properties on that side, one that I intended to keep in tenant uh, in Edmonton, and then one I bought in Langley, British Columbia, that I plan to sell an assignment. And then on the personal side, I had this big HELOC. Right. So I basically started investing. Um, I used some of it to put into my TFSA for a land development deal that stood to make between 25 to 30% annual compound interest over seven years. So turn 50 into close to 200. And then I also did a few syndicated mortgages. So that was kind of my first taste of private lending in the sense that I'm actually making positive cash flow from it. Right. And then talk to a friend. She's like, you really have to talk to my mortgage broker. And then it just literally continued to spiral from there. You know, he was giving me deals that were 20, 25%. I'm paying in the glory days three. Uh, (laughs) So I'm making that spread and I just started to, you know, not be as dependent on my business. Like I was actually able to cut my pay in half because I had so much money coming in from private lending. And then COVID happened and we couldn't even run events anymore. So I just stopped taking money from my company completely. And I literally was able to live off the private lending and all the passive income coming in. Right. Yeah, it's awesome. It's it's definitely a great passive income tool, especially because it's backed by the real estate market. Yeah, so yeah. you get something like COVID, if anything, all those private deals you're on, they actually yeah. increased in value. So your yeah. value became a lot lower. So Absolutely. it's great. Yeah. And what are some 
passive income opportunities or even any real estate opportunities you would suggest for someone that's like a first timer you know how much should they should they be looking to get into like how much dollar wise should they have yeah uh just because we get that question a lot you know people like well how much can i start with private lending i tell them Mm -hmm. even as low as twenty five thousand syndication yeah yeah, ten thousand five thousand with someone to syndicate you with yeah you can start off so what are some examples for first-time investors for sure so i guess it depends on what what it is. I mean, when you are looking at real estate investors specifically, oftentimes the lowest will be around 50000 Right. And that could be for someone looking to uh, buy an underperforming property and renovate it, or if they're doing land development or something like that. Because if they have to raise a million dollars, it's easier to do that with, you know, 20 investors rather than mm-hmm. 200 investors, right? right? But the mortgage broker I was working with, he would bring me deals sometimes that were 20000 10000 but still very lucrative. Like I could be making 500 a month on 10000 over six months could be 2000 on 20000 right. for two weeks. You know, sometimes it could be a, a bridge loan. So it could be someone that has to pay off their mortgage before it closes, sorry, pay off their line of credit before their mortgage closes. So it could be just wiping, you know, $20,000 for a couple of weeks, and then they'll pay you back as soon as the new mortgage closes. Um, in other instances, it could be a principal and interest loan. So it could be, you know, the balance owing plus the interest payment. Right. And then what's very, very common with the real estate investors is interest only loans. So those tend to be 15 to 20%, and then you'll get the principal payment back when basically the investment matures, which could be a year. You know, sometimes it's been two years, but I would say 12 to 18 months is most common. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you find that that's really helped you educate your clients when they're purchasing a property and understanding how to leverage that Mm -hmm. and and what's a good buy, cap rates, all that stuff? Like they must lean on you for that in a big big way yeah i mean it's something i don't lead with that like obviously if i'm meeting with a client to talk about listing their home or buying a property but i think you just naturally start to get to know each other and one thing i found is that some of my clients you know they're selling a home and their mortgage could be literally double what they bought the home for so you're really seeing like yes of course they have equity because they've owned it for a period of time but they're not walking away with maybe quite as much money as they could have been if their their debts were lower. All so right. I talk to them depending on their circumstances about just the options that they have if they're looking to bring in additional income. You know, sometimes people could be getting on in their years, they're looking to scale back at work or retire completely, and this could be something that even supplements their income, right? So I try to give them some guidance in terms of you know, what I've found to be successful for, for me um, and then how they can do their due diligence and the legal support that they would require. And sometimes people are scared and they don't want anything to do with it, but other times people have done it and it's it's really, really helped them. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm having such a positive impact on people that, you know, this is making them, you know, breathe a little bit easier and just know that they have that extra income coming in when maybe they can't work. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. for sure. And, and to go to your point a little bit, um, what you guys were talking about a little bit before there, borrowing money in the glory days that say at three, four percent, even if you're getting it now at six, seven yeah. percent, but being able to do what you could do with it on the other end, 20, 25 percent plus yeah. fees, what that spread looks like, let's say 15 points, just to yeah. shoot a rough number out to operate an intense business be there fee for service day yeah. in day out you know and clock in those hours like you're you're a good operator if you can achieve a 15 20 25 percent bottom yeah. line yeah. with this it's literally passive right yeah so it's 100 percent get- passive you do the contract and then you wait for payday so yeah. i just get a series of email transfers kind of throughout the month which is obviously very nice <laughs> yeah. but i look at it from the sense of like i'm not just trading my time for money anymore like working as a realtor is one stream of income but i literally have 18 streams of income right now right just personally like not including other loans that I have corporately set up and stuff like that as well. So if you think about that, it's so risky. And people say, oh, isn't investing so risky? Private lending so risky. I said, no, having one job and one income, that's the most risk I think that you can possibly have because you lose your job and you lose your income. Like, what are you going to do, right? And I think a lot of people during COVID really struggled if they had a job that was deemed unessential like myself. Mm. So I'm so grateful looking back that I started doing all of this like, maybe only just a year to a year and a half prior to COVID. But, you know, things could have been much more difficult had I not been doing this, right? Right, So I think that's the way that people want to look at it. Like, it's not just a matter of where you are right now. It's a matter of where you could find yourself unexpectedly a year from now or five years from now, right? Mm. So you just want to set yourself up so that you do have a lot of different options. Yeah, diversification, 100%. Mm. Yeah. 
That's awesome. And then what do you what do you look to do in regards to scaling out your portfolio moving forward, given yeah. the, the current climate of the market? Is the Toronto market still appealing to you the way that it did, you know, <laughs> yeah. rewind the clock? So it's a never few appealed to me back, personally. Right? <laughs> so okay. as I mentioned, I bought in Florida, Edmonton, and Langley. Um, in fact, mm. I'm actually looking in Arizona right now in terms of short term rentals. Nice. I was introduced to someone in uh, January through my mastermind that buys wholesale properties in Arizona. And the benefit is that you're buying them low enough that they can cash flow very, very well. But in the instance that short-term rentals disappeared, like a COVID situation, you can still support your mortgage. So that's where, you know, that's a very, very important because sometimes people could go into a mortgage that's very high thinking, I'm going to short-term rental it for $1,000 a night. Well, if you have vacancy or something happens, you still have to support your debt, right? So right. their model is set up that you can still afford to cover it no matter what situation. In fact, they have uh, relationships with an insurance company. So if they did require, you know, longer, shorter stays, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Like not a long-term rental, but with like long-term tenants for short periods of time, yeah. they can satisfy that with the insurance company. So that's one possibility. And then I'm also looking at multifamilies in the East Coast, again, just because they can, they can cash flow. Right. And then like cap rates, what are you, what are you looking at? Like what really yeah. hits the nail on the head for you? And so, yeah, like, I'll, yeah, I, I don't even look at cap rates to be honest. Um, to me, I just look at the net operating income. So I want to look okay. at what the full carrying costs are and then what your expected income is going to be. Right. So for me, I want to know that if I can make X number of dollars in private lending, I want to at least make that same thing back from an acquisition of a purchase. So right. I had put in an offer on a property last June in Cape Breton, and it was 22 units across six pro properties. So it was a, a package of properties, and it would have cash flowed with the mortgage around 80000 a year. So I thought that's pretty good. Like in Toronto or any part of the, the greater GTA, that's not necessarily as feasible. And then in addition, money aside, you've got the LTB. So that's an ongoing concern. Like I have a client right now that just had a hearing Monday because she tenanted part of her primary residence and can't get them out to sell it. So right. I just... Honestly, as an investor, I just don't want to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't mean that you can't find good deals here. You know, obviously you can have really good tenants, but I think you just have to be aware of the laws. You know, Edmonton was landlord friendly. So I had an instance with one of my tenants. We had our hearing in like three weeks. So you want to know that if you've got an issue, you can resolve it really quickly. Right. Yeah. And and how do you feel about like multifamily and what appreciation looks like compared to yeah. other style of properties out there like commercial, yeah. industrial and, and what that looks like five, 10 years down the road? Yeah, I think there's huge opportunities in multifamily. And, you know, I saw a speaker recently, what he liked about it, he goes, you know, you can just stop the stop the bleeding more easily. So if you have one tenant out of 10 that leaves unexpectedly, that, well, that's one of 10. Yeah. If you have a single family home, you lose your rent, then you're covering all those expenses, right? Yeah. So I think that's one side of it that gives you some added security. But what I'm seeing is that most people are taking on, you know, these underperforming properties, they're doing cash for keys, they're turning it over. And I can give an example from some other investors in my mastermind that bought a property for uh, $7.5 million for 36 units. They're turning over cash for keys. Um, their goal is to have them all turned over in about a year and a half to two years. And it, ideally, it'll reappraise around 12000 so that's a four and a half million dollar increase in just three years. So right. they'll pay out their investors and probably pocket a few million to put into their next project. Right. So I think you're not, I don't want to say you can't cash flow at all. It's a little bit harder to maybe find a fully turnkey cash flowing property for multifamily here. Um, but the underperforming burrs seem to be like where most people are making their money right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it goes to what we're doing right now with yeah. our space, Strive. We have a concept mm -hmm. right now that's it's Strive. It's a co-working concept. Yeah. Essentially, we have a property management company that's going to take on industrial yeah. commercial space, bust it up and and sell you know individual spaces and we're averaging out what we're looking at the numbers at anywhere from 200 to 300 per square foot yeah which is unheard of right yeah, so yeah. but again to go to your point right like you're diversifying mm -hmm. through the amount of tenants that you have so you're lowering yeah. your risk yeah shows a shows good cash flow the banks will end on that yeah. you know and uh yeah. creates for in this case when it comes to our industry, a solid environment with all of our ecosystem being yeah. able to surround our headquarters, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, we're, I think diversification is like just the number one thing you should consider, right? Like, mm -hmm. obviously, I've been private lending, but I had my daughter three months before COVID, so I didn't have time to be active, right? So yeah. this is just one of the easiest options for me. But the downside of private lending is that there's no appreciation. So at the end of a period of a term, you get your money back, but 
you know, it's not like you have the asset appreciation the way that you would in other instances. So that's right. why I want to, you know, ideally use my corporate money for, you know, tangible property assets. And then I'll stick to the private lending on the personal side with my HELOC. And then the benefit now as realtors, we can have personal real estate corporations. So anything I make as a realtor will go there. Mm -hmm. I don't take that personally. And then yeah. I'll just dividend that up to my whole code to buy more assets. Yeah, nice. <laughs> so that's Love kind the of the plan. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, for anyone that wants to know, Serena does unsecured loans. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. hit her up. Yeah. So I'm <laughs> she signing my, my, my 50th. Yeah. Just playing with well, you. I'm signing up my 57th deal uh, right now. Like it there should be go. locked down within the next couple of weeks. And then there I have another go. one lined up for middle of April. So I think the most important thing is just to keep your cash moving. Like as soon as you know a deal is coming to the end, like line up the next one, just keep your money constantly moving and mm -hmm. obviously give yourself a buffer, like make sure that you don't leave yourself too short and you're not over leveraged because right. you just never know, like maybe you have an right. unexpected repair at home or something comes up. So you do want to make sure that you've got that available to you as well. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And in light of, you know, in light of what would it cost, what would it cost for you to become the lender? What's yeah. that look like for you? What are you holding? Besides the interest you're paying on your HELOC, what yeah. else? What other expenses do you have with that? Yeah, for sure. So early on, I had my real estate lawyer look over some of the deals. And ultimately, I wanted to make sure that the people I'm loaning to own the property that is listed. So yes, it's unsecured in the sense that I'm not on title mm -hmm. the way that you would be in a first position or a second position mortgage. But in almost all of these deals, there's still a property listed that right. I can put a lien on if they default. So my lawyer would take a look at the property, make sure that they're on title, but then also look at the equity in the property. So they have refinanced a bunch of times or, mm -hmm. you know, if they've been there for 20 years and everything looks good. Right. So he would take a look at that. And I have walked away from a couple of deals just because it didn't look great on paper. Um, now that I have my real estate license, I'll also look on Geo Warehouse and do some of that due diligence myself to make sure that they are on title. I collect their identification and you know, due diligence in the standpoint of credit checks, uh, make sure that they have appropriate insurance if they're right. renovating or something like that. A homeowner's insurance alone is not sufficient. You want to see a builder's insurance because if they have a fire and it burns down, they won't be covered with regular homeowner's policies. So right. um, maybe my lawyer would charge like a couple hundred dollars to look that over. But now that I've been doing it long enough, like a lot of those deals are, you know, pretty consistent. So right. I'll, I'll do a lot of my own due diligence myself. And then the legal fees, when you, it comes to registering on the property, that's mm -hmm. held by the borrower. The borrower Well, there's nothing fees. registered on it. So that's, again, being unsecured. Or if you're unsecured. Yeah, ones, if yes. you're unsecured, if you are going to be secured, then I guess you'll probably work with a lawyer or maybe like a mortgage broker or right. someone like that to get that set up. And then when it comes to your property, so you have, you know, Edmonton, you're looking at Arizona, you're yeah. looking at Florida. Are you taking that on yourself or is there property management companies yeah. you're, you're partnering with or working with? Yeah. So for my first property, I did most of the management myself, but I didn't think that I would be. Mm -hmm. um, I used some family friends who were realtors that, you know, like, you know, we'll get this booked for you. It'll be all about like eight weeks booked. And they didn't bring us one booking in four <laughs> years. Um, so we used VRBO to keep it booked most of the time. And, you know, there was definitely some vacancies and not quite the management that I expected. Like they would book the cleaners for me mm -hmm. and make sure like there was no damage and stuff like right. that. Um, and then with Edmonton, I, I had a property management company. Like they dealt with the leases, they vetted all the tenants, they dealt with issues and I would just be notified if there was an issue, like, you know, maybe what the cost was. Right. Uh, one disadvantage was that getting the property manager in when there was an issue sometimes in one instance took a little while, like their electricity was like through the roof. Like it went from a few hundred to like 800, 1100, 1500, like month over month. And I was like, are they, do they have a grow up in the basement? Like what is <laughs> happening? There's gotta be a reason for this. And they finally went in after three months and they found that they had these giant space heaters in the garage because it gets so cold in Edmonton, they're worried that their cars wouldn't start. So there was a viable reason. Like there's a reason the electricity was spiraling um, and they obviously had to pay it back, but they probably didn't realize like how was. much consumption yeah. was really being used. So it would have been nice had they gone in a little bit sooner, but it took three full months. So right. obviously that was like a significant impact on cost just to check, check on that. So you have to just budget that in. Um, my property manager charged like a lease up fee. So it was about $550 anytime the tenant turned over and then 8% on a regular month to month. And then for short-term rentals, you could even be looking as high as maybe like 15 to 20%. Okay. Like I know people that have properties in Costa Rica, for example, or other places. And, you know, because those turnovers so frequently, then you could be looking at a much higher percentage, right. but you're also making a lot more on those uh, properties. Right. 
at this point, I looked at it like karma, like I'm just helping people and it's building because there's people I even keep in contact with. We even share deals. Like I met a guy through the Joe Fairless podcast and we talk like every so often now and, mm-hmm. um, you know, he has some short-term rentals in the Smoky Mountains in Orlando, but like we kind of swap deals back and forth now and, you know, it's kind of yeah, just yeah. building that community and connections. But then if I need help, like I'm looking at different markets, like mm-hmm. he could be a contact. So I think eventually I do need to monetize it if it starts to monopolize like too much of my time. Um, at this point, I haven't done that yet. Um, but I knew, do know some people that do a private lending businesses that I might work towards that. But for now, I'm happy to just like answer people's questions. And, you know, I even have a list. I'm like, these are all the people I've lent with, all the people I've considered. Because sometimes people just don't know where to start. So if they're not in an investor's community, they wouldn't even know who to talk to to find these opportunities, right? So. But with that being said, right, like when you say monetize it, the way you're gauging your ROI, how is that exactly? Because through yeah. relationship building, adding value, yeah. and you know, fast forwarding time, the road's very long, right? Yeah, so yeah. what does that look like ROI? Yeah, with that ways side, gauge, I'm not looking at it right? yet, but there are some you know, a couple buyers, for example, I'm going to be working with. And right. I think they're attracted to me because they know that I can help them maybe from a different perspective. It's not 100%. just like finding your house. Like yeah. maybe you could house hack. Maybe you could take advantage of this. So they want to be able to have me available for those things. Yeah. So like it all kind of ties together. Yeah. But I know people that they have a private lending business. They vet all the deals and maybe they take a couple percent spread by placing the funds or something like that. So right. eventually maybe... But for now, I just look at it like I'm helping people paying it forward. And if I can help them and help the people raising money, like it's a good mutually yeah, beneficial of si- situation. Of course. Yeah. And and even with like these investors that are scaling property management companies yeah. or that <laughs> are scaling their real estate portfolio or that are moving and shaking yeah. in that space. Like if I if I was if I wasn't as financially literate as I am because I'm in the space and yeah. I'm looking at real estate and I'm saying this is a solid way to build real wealth yeah and what my profession is is so far off the beaten path from the real estate industry as a whole so I need to plug into experts that can really guide me in the right direction you hit two birds with one stone yeah because not only are you buying them the property you're advising them on the cash flow you're advising them on appreciation you're advising them on how to leverage the capital in that home through equity absolutely further scale the portfolio so the roi could be gauged on your real estate gross commissions and and how you help them in in that area right yeah or or a property management company if you're kicking out clients to them left right and center yeah the property management company has people that they can send your way and say hey if you're looking to add another piece or two to your portfolio out in Arizona, we have some. Well, it's all connected. And that's why I looked at it. Like I was like, I'm happy to help. The reality is it does take time. Like I could spend a half an hour to an hour, but then some people after I've had that call, they're like, can I talk to you again? Like, I mean, I'll pay for your time. Like, can you coach me on it? And it's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. Like I, I can give some input on what I've done, but they still need to do their own due diligence. Like I wouldn't want to be responsible if a deal went sideways. Yeah. And I thought it looked good, like, because you just never know what could happen, right? So you've got yeah. to be very careful. Like, obviously, I don't want to jeopardize my real estate license or and my reputation. So I can tell yeah. people that this is great. These are people I've talked to, people I know. But I try to, like, include that little discla- disclaimer with the list to be like, you still need to be responsible for, yeah. you know, looking into these things on your own, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and and yeah. the, just uh, not, not that, like, it's something that's worked for me, right? Yeah. You're very well articulated in the way you speak. You're detailed. You're like, you're motoring. You could tell like this <laughs> off of the tip of your tongue. Yeah. It's happened like a Well, and I'm passionate times about before, it because but... I'm like, it changed my life. It saved me during COVID. Yeah, you could tell. And then for other people, it's like, you know, I, there's so many people now I'm like that have done it and yeah. they're like, they're, yeah. they're loving it yeah. if they've taken the risk and they're doing it. Other people are like, talk to them about it for five years and they're still terrified. So you're just yeah. not going to change those people, right? So if you can have that positive impact, like to me, that's so fulfilling to know like, sure. you know, this person could retire or semi-retire. This is helping them. Like to me, like even in my tagline, like I don't want to sell the most houses. I want to help the most people. Yeah. Yeah. Selling houses will come along with that, but you want to know you're helping those people. Like there's so much more to it than just selling a house. Yeah. Well, so. that that's, that's the, the end I'll say all it's contribution yeah. and purpose. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Like you get yeah. the most out of that in regards to reward. Little yeah. tip I'd like to throw you though. <laughs> when you know you're going in deep with someone, you're like, yeah. all right, they're asking for it. I'm <laughs> yeah. going to go. I'm going to yeah. give them this Yeah. again. Cause you love to do it. You're passionate about it. They yeah. want to hear it. Yeah. Say, Hey, on the other end of the phone, hit record right now. <laughs> do it. Well, you know what I do I is I 
I have, deep with people and it's like I, I share my podcast with them at this point right because right. someone even yeah. said that once she goes I wish <laughs> I could have recorded what you just said yeah. to me yeah so now I just give people my playlist and my podcast if I've talked about it because I right you know they can listen to probably 10 podcasts where I've talked about it yeah, yeah, yeah. and hear it 10 different ways yeah. you know so yeah. yeah get a skinny view out of it yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah yeah okay uh want to wrap it up yeah for sure yeah well thank you so much for coming out today and uh talking about creating that passive income i'm sure a lot of viewers are going to be very interested in that uh so where could people find you yeah for sure so i'm on social at serena holmes realtor i also wrote a book called the accidental entrepreneur so anyone's interested in that i do talk about how i even came across this in much more detail um and you can find that at serena holmes author Awesome. Sounds great. Well, thank you again. And uh, thank you again for tuning to this week's episode. Be sure to like, follow, share, hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you next week.